Oh, can I do it? Hey, how is everybody? Hang on, sorry, I'm, you'll see what's going on here in a second. Oh, uh, there we go. Hey, how are you, everybody? I'm back. I was in Missouri last week, and now I'm here, and uh, I'm playing an East Man. An Eastman, there's an E10, E10 D T C. So, this is Torrified Sitka Spruce Top, nope, Torrified Adirondack Spruce Top, Mahogany Back and Sides, Mahogany Neck, Ebony Bridge, Ebony Fingerboard, Handmade in uh, China, in Beijing, and um, really, really an excellent guitar. 1500 bucks for this one. This one came from my friend Doug at Guitar San Diego. So anyway, let me come over here to the comments. I also need to. Um, okay, I'm gonna. I'll look at the comments here in a second. I'm gonna play this guitar just for a minute until we get some people coming in. So 20 couple of us now, 27. But uh, I'm glad you're here. Tell me where you're from, and I'll check the comments here in a second. Anyway, well, how are you guys? How was your uh, how was your Memorial Day week? Oh boy. Okay, I'm gonna put this guitar down. But look at this thing first. So, I mean, just a really good good looking guitar. Um, this one will be for sale. It's not for sale yet, but I'll put it on the website here soon. I also have the E6, the OM that I'll put up as well. Okie dokie, let's see, who's here? Uh, man, bunch of comments. Uh, Michael, this one came in earlier. Michael, my dad and I love Martins. Uh, me too, I love Martins. And um, I don't own one right now, that's kind of weird. Um, yeah, I can watch part of this while I prepare and eat my lunch. Interested in see how the topic is defined. Yeah, um, it'll, be, it'll be an exciting one. This is basically like, just when, <laughs> the amateur things that we all do. Um, and we were working to get better, all of us. Um, but these are just going to be some funny, kind of annoying things, kind of funny things, sometimes downright insulting things. And, um, oh boy, got a tea bag. Need to put it in the trash. Hang on one sec. Ah! Okay. Um, hey, Maximilian's here. Ta-da! Today, finally, I can watch the whole show live. Awesome! I'm excited you're here. Maximilian. What a name. Badaro is, co is coming from Morocco. Connor. Hey, buddy. Connor Forrest. Um, very nice quality vids and lights. Thank you. Um, I'm using a long lens, so you're actually, like, by the back wall. But I really like the way this looks. Also, there's a bunch of stuff on my desk that you don't see in this. So, it's easier. I also just like this. Yeah, I don't want to downplay it. I thought a lot about like, there's a good key light here. There's a fill light over there. There's two lights back there. There's a floor, a light on the ground. So anyway, um, Matt McFarlane from Sunny Paisley. Let's do this. Awesome. Glad you're here, man. East Tennessee checking in. Yeah. How is, how's my mic? Let me, it looks, ah, hang on. That is funny. How is that even working? It wasn't. That's the, okay. Um, never mind. Okay, here we go. So there we go. I'll turn this up just a smidge. How's that sound? It looked like it was low. Um, Al Phillips from India. Holy cow! I'm glad you're here. Um, I guess technically, yeah. Holy, holy cow! It's right. Um, man, that is so fun. DW from the Great White North. Uh, hey everyone from Baldwin, Michigan. Man, there's all kinds of places here. Gary from Ireland. Um, let's see. Eastman guitars are underrated. Their parlor guitars are especially nice. I think so too. I, I feel like I'm super late to the party. Not that I wasn't. I was trying to get into this party for a while. Um, but I feel like I just am getting my head around Eastman guitars. And it's been really fun kind of getting to know them. And, um, 
Yeah, the my favorite so far there was that one I played last week. If you watched the live show with John, um, his it's the prototype of the varnish round shoulders. That's that's a guitar I've thought about a couple times this week and thought maybe I should text him, John. I like this guitar. Who do I have to smooch to get this guitar? Uh, McDowell County Young Life. Hey, uh, hey, buddy. Um, and hey, oh, Sonia's here. Hi, Sonia. Um, Mr. Jose Benito uh, Martinez is here as well. Hey, buddy, how are you? How's California? <clears throat> um, yes. Do you remember how much? Uh, do you remember how much did you sell your 2017 D18 D28? <clears throat> I sold that guitar. Um, I remember how much I sold it for. I sold it for. Do I remember? Hang on, let me remember first when I sold that. I sold that in the begin end of middle or end of 2019. Yeah, I have to remember. So here's a fun fact. Um, so the house years ago when I was starting to make videos, there was like you could tell it was in a living room, um, like a long room with like wooden floors, and um, the one that I do most of those D18 or D28 videos. Um, was actually my parents old house and right around that time my dad sold that house and then very quickly it got demolished so that house is gone now so I'm thinking that video was in that house which means that had to be 2018 or 2019 probably yeah probably early 2019 that that happened and um, but anyway so I sold that guitar for $2,300 and it went to Indonesia um, so we had to pay, it was like $450 in shipping to get it over there. So anyway, cool guitar. Um, I love the reimagined 28s. Um, hello from Chicago. Hello from Southern New Jersey. Awesome. Yo, from Florida, Richie. Hey man, glad you're here. Um, hey, cool. This is live. This is live. Um, yeah. You're alive. I'm alive. This is happening live. Um, John says, good day. Hope you enjoyed your time in misery. In Missouri. Yeah, in uh, in Missouri. I really liked it. It was super fun. That's the first time I've ever been to Missouri. And um, it, was, it was a fun place. Amazing guitars. It's funny. And like, I was there for three days. We played guitar and made videos and talked about guitars the whole time. Even when we went to dinner, we're like, these buffalo wings are great. Anyway, the problem with the scale length on a, you know, Huss and Dalton, blah, 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 whatever, um, we still talk guitars. And even in that, I still sat outside at the hotel at night wishing I had a guitar with me to plunk and play. And um, so it was a super, super fun time. And um, let's see. Hello from Charleston. Hey, Joel. A um, bunch of patrons in here, too. Fires every, oh, boy. Day nine in a row of 115 degree plus. Oh boy. Man, I'm praying for you guys. That's a lot. That's intense. We're on the other, um, it's like an El Nino pattern over here. So we're getting tons and tons and tons of rain. Like it's rained every day for a month for us. Um, my kids have asked when they're going to see the sun again. Um, it's actually sunny today. Um, so Robert says, what's, uh, what's up with Ebony? Uh, What's up with the ebony that Martin is using? So much of the new guitars don't have all black ebony. It looks more like rosewood. Um, that's a really good question. I think part of it, I think some ebony, my understanding is that some of it has been dyed in the past. Um, yeah, and there's more and more just like stripey, not jet black. So I don't know. I mean, my first assumption would be possible D4. I don't know enough about ebony trees to know if we're running out and therefore the quality has to drop and we're getting more streaky stuff. But I also know it's also coming a little more into fashion. Um, I'm trying to think. What guitars do I have? These, both of these new Eastmans have ebony bridge and fingerboard and they're pretty, pretty dark. But even the, I made the fretboard yesterday for my Showalter and um, it's mostly black. There's a couple little... Uh, lighter spots, little little light streaks in there. But Kevin, greetings from Columbus, Missouri. Thanks for uh, thanks for your help recently online. I love the Atkin J43, but I think I I need to bring it back up. Took away some of the magic. Oh, you took the action down. Okay, um, man, that's fun. Yeah, if you're in Columbia, you're you're close to the acoustic shop. Um, this is an awesome hat. I love like I have a lot of hats and a lot of t-shirts, and um, but I really 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 like this hat. Um, also, I got a big boy head, 
So look at that thing. I mean, that's like all the way stretched out. And uh, yeah, I I was I was hanging out with a friend last night watching some football. Um, they were watching football. I don't care about football, um, but uh, I care about people. That's why I was there. But um, anyway, uh, I just noticed his hat. I was like, oh, his hat has six snaps on it. And for me, I'm like at best, I'm two, like the last two straps. So or the snaps. Um, let's see. My Eastman J45 copy E10 SS is ridiculously good with an Anthem SL. Get compliments every time I take it out. Glad you're on the Eastman stuff. Me too. I'm super excited. Evan is here. Evan. Hey, Evan, did you get the Ruby sorted out? I guess you did. I got an email saying that it had been transferred from me. So I'm assuming it worked out. I'm sorry I haven't followed back on that. So Evan bought my uh, UA, the Ruby, the box uh, amp and a pedal. And, uh, and I hung on to the um, the Dream 65. Dade City, Florida. I've been to Dade City, Florida. Missouri. Uh, my grandpa. He wasn't really my grandpa. It was my mom's best friend. When I was in middle school, I had three grandparents die within six weeks of each other. It was miserable. And um, my mom's best friend, they lived here in town. And uh, he took us out to lunch one day. He was like, hey, boys, uh, a lot of people call me grandpa. And um, I'd, I'd like it very much if I could be your grandpa. And so he was my grandpa, uh, Grandpa Norm. And um, so Norm grew up in Missouri. And he always, he told this story. And it's actually in a video that'll go out when I do my videos with the acoustic shop. Um, he would always tell me this story about how he couldn't go to World War II because he was playing farm league baseball. And uh, Sam Walton stomped on the foot with his metal cleats as he turned first base. And... Uh, I don't know if that's true, but I like it. But yeah, that's why I always asked him why he didn't go to World War II, and he had a broken foot. Anyway, yeah, the streaky ebony does look cool. Um, so streaky ebony is more common than we think, and and is often dyed. That's what I've heard too, is that it's often dyed, um, which I'm okay with that. But um, hi from the UK, I'm watching while noodling. Oh man. Uh, while playing on my uh, Atkin L36 parlor guitar. Maple back and sides. Dude, oh man, I keep forgetting you guys haven't seen my videos because they're not done. I haven't finished editing them yet. But I played, that was a guitar, an L30, uh, yeah, an L34, J34. What do they call theirs? Yeah, an L34. <coughs> and um, it was similar Maple back and sides. No, it was U, uh, Y E W, back and sides. And it was unbelievable. Seven and three quarters. I'm yeah. I'm seven and three quarters or seven and seven eighths. Um, big old hit. Staley. Hey, buddy. Staley's here. Corn turkey. Uh, Josh. Hey, Josh. Uh, sorry. I'll get back to you today. Uh, not today. I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Um, but I've seen your stuff coming through. Um, Evan. Yeah. Everything worked out. Sounds incredible. That's awesome. It's a fun pedal. I'm glad it worked out. That was a little a little bit of stress. So. It's, you're starting to see the problem of having gear that has like licenses and software and like Bluetooth to it. Um, it just got to Evan and it like wouldn't power on or stay powered on or something. And I kept getting notifications that it was saying that uh, my pedal, like, do you still have your pedal? It looks like someone looks like you sold it. Um, so it worked out. But anyway. All right. Um, Jonathan Brooker says, call me weird, but after trying hog, rose and walnut back and sides. Guitars. I have to say, Maple is my new favorite. That's a funny. Oh, got it. Okay, the comma threw me off there. Uh, after trying mahogany, rosewood, and walnut, um, we need an Oxford comma there. After trying mahogany, rosewood comma, and walnut back and sides guitars comma, I have to say, Maple is my new favorite. Yeah, I totally get that. Um, maple is punchy. I just got um, the uh, Wright Luthery J35 back. And that guitar is, it's maple back and sides, it's a round shoulder, it's a Martin scale length, and it is unfreaking believable. It's such a good sounding guitar. And so I think that one I'm going to keep, ugh, I can't say that anymore. But I think the way it's going to shake out, I don't think, I think I'll keep that one, and I think I'm going to sell my house in Dalton TDM. Uh, if you're interested, it's still for sale. But anyway, okay, 
with all that said, let's get into this. So, um, hello, and, oh, where'd my title go? Hang on, where did it go? What? Hang on. What happened? Hang on, I've got to import, I've got to import a graphic. My timing's gonna be all thrown off now. Well, uh, welcome to Amateur Hour. Now, this is just going to be things that happen in guitar deals that drive me crazy or embarrass me. I've done a lot of these things. I've had a lot of these things done to me. As you find them along the way, let me know what you've experienced. But if you're buying and selling guitars a lot, you're going to have these things happen, and they're going to feel herky-jerky. They're going to feel like they're breaking your gate as you're in that process. And a lot of times we kind of fly by our intuition, but there are some genuine rules that need to be kind of followed and paid attention to and honored along the way. And so, welcome to Amateur Hour. Number one, uh, when people pull crap, like one time I had this, and this is just a story that kind of led to most of this. I negotiated with a guy, I was buying, it was a Larave. I was buying a Larave DO3 in New Orleans it was, uh, where, if you're from New Orleans, it was in the Garden District at the whole, at Whole Foods, uh, right on Esplanade or Chapatulas. Anyway, it's, it was at, uh, hang on, it was on Magazine, but it was at the Whole Foods, and, like, you, the way it works, you have to park and kind of walk your way in, and, um, so we negotiate the deal, and I, I'm like, all right, I'm gonna buy your guitar, 550 bucks. All right, I'm super excited about this. We look at the guitar. I'm looking all through it. And one of the things that I do as a courtesy is I offer people back stuff out of the case, like case candy. And so I open it up and I was like, oh, hey, there's a set of strings here. You know, it's five strings. That's not my style. If I break a string, I'm just going to finish that show and then change all strings. So I don't keep loose strings in my guitar case. I keep a fresh set of guitar strings. Anyway, so I was offering him like a capo and some picks and some and five strings out of a pack. And he's like, "Well, it's okay. Just leave it in the case. I'll I'll take the case with me." And I was like, "What?" And he's uh, and I said, "Excuse me." And he's like, "Oh, well, I'm I'm gonna take the case." And I had to say, "Nope, sorry. Like we made the deal. I buy the guitar and I buy the case." The other thing that was weird was that this was the last. The guy didn't own any other guitars, so I don't know why he was keeping the case. It wasn't a DO3, it was an LO3, because it was an unusual shape. That's the other part, is I had to tell him, like, hey, like, this is a, a Larave L shape. It's not really the shape of any other guitars, um, like maybe a Gibson L00, but, you know, you, you wouldn't, this case wouldn't fit most guitars. Um, so anyway, yeah, this one, like, kind of broke my gate. So one of the things that happens is uh, just amateur hours when people change the terms of the deal after the deal is done. And uh, you'll see there's some more kind of around this topic. But this is one that I just couldn't get over. Um, yeah, have you guys had this happen? Have you had anyone change the deal after you after you make the deal? Wait, what? That is such a great guitar. So, E.J. Henderson slope shoulder, uh, slope shoulder with oak back and sides and an Addy top is my current rate fave. That's an amazing guitar. All right, so I'm going to keep moving. So, yeah, when people, yeah, it's freaking amateur hour, which is nonsense when people do that. So that was one that the way that that eventually shook out was me just saying like, hey, man, we made a deal. If you wanted to keep the case, you need to tell me, and I would have paid $100 less. And so I was like, if you want to keep the case, I need $100 back. And he's like, well, I don't know. You could probably get a case for less than that. And I literally looked up Google and Reverb, and I showed him. I was like, hey man, there is no universe that I could find another case for a Larave, like a hard case made by TKL. Not super nice, but just the shape of this guitar. And it was $140. And so I was like, I'll eat the 40 bucks if you want me to just buy another one. But I also have to walk out of here with a guitar. Like I'm driving home. Like I don't want to take a guitar home without a case. And why would you keep a case that doesn't fit your guitar? So he eventually relented and we just worked, we just set the deal. And it was like, okay, we're good. We are good. Just get out of here. So anyway, that was one. Yeah, that one happened right at the very beginning of me making YouTube videos. Number two, uh, an amateur move is to just buy whatever the most recent YouTube trend is, whether that's an American Pro 2, whether that's anything Josh Scott talks about. 
Love Josh Scott. I'm super excited about what he's doing. Also, his Monday morning things have been some of the coolest content I've seen. His history of electric guitars and pedals, like his ability to add structure and a framework and a lens for understanding the trends and the movements in the history of electric guitars is incredible. But the unfortunate power that he also wields is he'll talk about a tube streamer clone or he'll break out an old Ibanez pedal and it will just set the market on fire. And um, yeah, like right now, look at the price of full tone pedals. Um, look at the price of Waterloo's have gotten crazy. That's part of why I sold my Waterloo is that they're just so high. So yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Watch out for the trends. I mean, they're, they're, they're big. What trends have you found yourself getting stuck on? Or I, I bought one and somehow made it out. Okay. Years ago when Anderton's, um, <clears throat> it was when Chappers, there was some video where they talked about the new Charvel, the San Dimas, and I just wanted one so badly. And I jumped, I was sitting, this is kind of bad. I was sitting at church. I, um, I'd watched the video before church. I'm sitting in church and I had my phone out for some reason. And I literally bought it while like going to the bathroom, like walking from one building to the other. Um, and I ordered a San Dimas. It was one of those like I offered and then they actually accepted. And so I got it for like 350 bucks, played it for two weeks, sold it for 500 bucks. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, yeah, YouTube trends can, can get you in trouble. Yep, Josh made you want to pull out your old phaser. Yep, that's how it goes. Oh, uh, yeah. It happens in, in construction world. It happens all the time. Yeah, people are renegotiating after they already pay or the deal's done. And that's different. Like, I understand in, in construction there's change orders. And it's, I mean, the money that gets spent the easiest in life is when you're like, oh, actually, we didn't talk about this beforehand, but I want the three-way light switches or I want the dimmer. And then you don't think about it. Like, that money is just imaginary. And then all of a sudden you're like, hold on. If I had known that for me to have dimmer switches throughout my whole house, it was going to be $1,200, I would have passed. Um, that's a, I made that example up. That's not a specific example. But anyway. Um, Connor says, how do you differentiate market trends, medium and long term, from YouTube short term trends? I have good success riding waves uh, and trade up when Jazz Masters came back into fashion really heavily. Um, okay. Let me pick this apart. How do you differ differentiate market trends, medium and long term, from YouTube trends? I think just that. I think looking at longer chunks of time, longer spans of time. Um, and then the other is fashion trends or like genre kinds of trends. And so that's when I keep talking about, I keep talking about, I call it the 25 year rule or the 30 year rule, um, which is what guitars were people playing in high school? What music was popular 30 years ago? That is the kind of guitars that will become more popular next. I am convinced, and I've proven, I've seen myself to be right in this, that, you know, years ago I started buying up all these shreddy guitars because I knew we're going to come back into shreddy heavy stuff. I didn't quite expect new music, like new metal and heavy stuff, to be uh, so, so heavily connected into the locking trends. But, um... But yeah, I made a bunch of money buying every old Jackson and Charvel and Randy Rhodes. That's one I wish I would have kept. I had a Randy Rhodes V um, that I bought in New Orleans at a uh, at Airline Pond. Great job. Right on Airline in Metairie in Louisiana. Um, but yeah, so I think that's part of the shorter trends. You start looking at like, okay, 15-year rolling window, what guitars, 30-year, what used to be cool and will come cool again. So I think the next one now is like all those offsets, like we're into like all the guitars that were played in like the Gin Blossoms and Vertical Horizon and Semisonic and like the late 90s, early 2000s alternative, all of the De Armand, Dan Electro, the Guilds, all that stuff is shooting up in value. I think when you look at the short term, you look at like what happened with Rhett, uh, when Rhett Shell talked about Skylark small tube amps. Like I've never seen anything quite like that. The value of a, of those amps, they were always 150, 250. Like they weren't anything really that people cared about. People would always say, well, if it was a Fender, it'd be worth some money. But Rhett did a thing that like overnight, 
those amps went up to five, six, seven hundred dollars, and they haven't really come down. All those little Skylarks, even though I had a Gibson Gibsonette that was just too big to be a small amp and too small to be a big amp, and it just never took off. But yeah, I think um, I think it's really wise to look at trends and to kind of figure out which are going to be popular next. Um, yeah, for there are some guitars that are just always on a general trend. Like, there's no video that someone could make about a Telecaster that would make Telecasters worth more than they are right now. Like, they're just, they've been cool, they will be cool, they've been made forever. So, that's a really, really good question. Okay, another good amateur hour move is, do we look at this one? Yep, by the most recent YouTube trend. Did we skip from three? Uh, I don't know where three is. We'll find three at some point in here. Hang on. There's no number six in my in the internal slides. Anyway, amateur hour. Don't negotiate, just buy. This is one that I should listen to more. Maybe it's not an amateur move, but I think sometimes when people just, they've got money burning a hole in their pocket, and or when it's someone else's money, if you're using a credit card, if you're using uh, even a debit card, like there's just, there's a lot of psychology of, you're not seeing actual dollars, and so you end up spending too much money. So yeah, don't negotiate, just buy. And um, sometimes, if you find a screaming deal, sometimes you just need to pay what they're asking. Um, there's a broken part of me that always offers less. Like no matter what the number is, I'm going to offer at least 50 to $80 less. And um, yeah, so anyway, don't do that. Don't be like me, be smart. Um, these are way out of order. Why? Okay, number five, um, buying, an electric, buying an electric guitar without checking the electronics. Now, with this, I do this a lot, but I think one of the ways in which you can get yourself in trouble, and this has only come to bite me one time, which is, um, I think for the most part, you're kind of you're kind of underwriting the risk buying a Mexican Strat, where it's like, well, I'm just going to buy this Strat. If it's working, great. If it's not working, there's only about $100 worth of stuff that could be wrong, um, you know, worst case scenario is a pot is out or a pickup is bad, um, or a pickup is swapped, but in certain guitars, like affordable guitars, pretty much anything that you'd swap into it is better than the stock, so you can't really lose. So I don't know how much, I wrote this, and I don't know how much I'm convinced by it. But, there's one time that this has really screwed me over, um, which is one of my first run-ins with Reverb.com which was I bought my first custom shop Strat. It was a 1960, it was a Wildwood. It was an unbelievably great Strat. And I don't love Strats, like I don't always buy Strats, but when I do, I try to make them count. And so I bought this one, it was a great three-tone sunburst. It was a heavy relic, it was really, really well done. And um, so when I got it, it was a guy that was like, a, he loved Johnny Lang, he was a very bluesy guy from New Orleans. And um, so he got this, <clears throat> and uh, when we talked about it, we just we met at the mall in a parking lot. I didn't have an amp actually because I had another deal coming. <clears throat> I was trading a '61. S it's crazy that I can remember these days, but I was I was meeting at the mall at Lakeside Mall in Metairie, Louisiana, and I was supposed to run over to the Barnes and Noble. Um, so this deal, I was buying a Strat, and then the next deal, I was trading a '61. A 61 Les Paul, like a SG big headstock. I was trading that for 500 bucks in cash and a, no, more than that, 700 bucks in cash and uh, a Marshall Class 5. But the way the deal worked out is I didn't have the amp with me at that point. It was like 30 minutes swapped around. Anyway, so fast forward, I never actually checked that. I didn't, and it would have worked fine. I just plugged the guitar in. It worked once I got home. But I sold it later uh, on Reverb, and a guy. The first thing he asked was he opened it up, and he claims that the he claims that the solder joints um, he claimed that the solder joints were redone, and that the pickup had been in and out, and that he said it's the original pickup, but someone swapped it at some point. I want five hundred dollars back. I was like, nope, just because somebody swapped out the bridge pickup. Um, I don't. Anyway, but I had no proof. I had no way to show that this guitar hadn't been messed with. I didn't have any reason to think it was. And um, Strat pickups aren't that expensive or hard to find. So to me, I just told them to, to kick rocks. And uh, I think I, I think Reverb still stepped in and gave them 100 bucks. Um, but anyway, 
yeah, sometimes it's stressful to buy guitars without, uh, without them. Whoa! Greetings from Hong Kong. How cool is that? Oh man, I saw this video. I I haven't watched it, but I saw it pop up today. Um, yeah, I talked. I talked to Baxter a couple weeks ago, and he kind of told me about this. And it's that dude has his ear to the freaking ground for the for the guitar market, for the retail market. I live in this third space where, like, I'm not a retailer. I'm an enthusiast. I'm also not a touring musician. Yeah, I'm in this third or fourth place that I don't I don't know where I am or who I am. I do. I do know who I am. But yeah, that's a that's an interesting thing. Hey, Mark Dugan. One of the guys from the band Live is selling his Telecaster on eBay. They played it at Woodstock 99 and toured it with it back in the day. The whole band signed it. That's awesome. Do they have a certificate of authenticity? Do they have a picture of them signing it? I mean, even if you're buying it from the guy, unless they're willing to sign literally a notarized a notarized affidavit with a picture of them signing it, most places, it's just, yeah. Because then it becomes memorabilia much more than it's a guitar. Mark Dugan, you know all these places in Louisiana I'm talking about. How many guitars have you bought from the Lakeside Mall parking lot? I'll meet you outside of Restoration Hardware. Um, I gotta go by Beck and Call. No, what's that place? Port of Call? Nope, that's the burger place. Morning. Morning Call. There it is. The beignet place. Um... A good way to negotiate a screaming deal is to ask the seller if they're dead set on listed price. Oh, man, we're going to talk about this. Um, that's a good way of saying it, but it still kills me. Um, High-end electric guitars, having swap pickups, can kill value, et cetera, can, can kill value. Not something I care about, but something, if you're very particular, even if they work, you can lose money. It's true, and that's what happened with me with this, was the guy... And it, he could show that it was the original pickup, but he didn't like that the solder joint for the bridge ground, the bridge pickup ground on the volume pot and um, the to the five-way switch. It was a three-way switch. Um, was that three-way? Five-way. I don't remember. Morning call. There we go. I got there eventually. Yeah, so I don't. I think that's where I'm starting to get. It's over there. I'm starting to get more clever. And when I buy guitars, especially electric guitars, either last week when I sold an ES125, I took my Tone Master because it's so light. The other one is I'll bring my Fender Mustang June, whatever that thing is, the Mustang headphone amp. Bring that and some headphones, <clears throat> and we're in business. Number six, amateur hour. Don't bring cash. Um, show up to a deal without cash. Oh my gosh, this is. <coughs> This kills me. Sorry, I need to drink some water. I keep holding my tea and not drinking it. Okay, this one, I'm gonna lean back a bit. Um, this one kills me, kills me, kills me, kills me, kills me. Um, so this one's happened to me a couple times. Actually, this whole idea for like amateur hour things is me trying to figure out a nicer way to tell a story that happened to me which there was a video, we ended up pulling the video after a while, uh, but it was a guy here in town who I've just never met more of just a doofus. Someone who had no instincts for people, relationships, negotiating, buying and selling, no sense of this. So many of these things come from me trying to sell a favela to this guy. And um, so anyway, so this one, um, we worked a deal and we get there and he's got cash or no, we get there and it's time for the deal to close. And he's like, all right, man, well, who do I make the check out to? And I said, no check. Don't write a check. You were supposed to bring cash. And he's like, I didn't know that. I was like, who doesn't know that? Like you come with cash. We buy, we buy, you know, deals are in cash. And there's another point to this. And I'll make the flip side of this point here in a minute in another amateur moment also done by this guy um, and many other people. But I think in a lot of these, just bring cash. Like, um, unless you specifically say it beforehand. And it, I do think the tide is changing a bit on this because ways to receive money is becoming a little more reliable. I've still only bought a couple guitars in PayPal, but I'm continually surprised. And I understand I have a reputation and I'm very public in who I am and what I do with guitars and so lots of people will buy guitars from me and they just PayPal me money. Um, and then I just 
get it shipped and do all the accounting on my end and all that stuff. But um, anyway, because it just, yeah, for me, PayPal saves, if someone buys it through my website, I'm giving away basically 4.5% by the time everything gets shaken out, all of the fees and everything. Uh, but yeah, amateur move, show up without cash. Oh, we're getting to this one. My pet peeve is when I re receive a message. What's your lowest price? Yeah. Yeah, that's good. We'll talk about that in a second. I'll, I've got that one as well. Raphael says he sold a guitar to a guy face-to-face, -face, and he texted me saying that it was all dinged. He had already, and he already had a great price. It wasn't dinged. I told him that was seen as, that was sold as is. Oh, yeah. <coughs> so I have a cough, and I think it's from, uh, I've been making my guitar with Showalter Guitars. Um, we've been doing like three days a week the last couple weeks. And yesterday, man, we were sanding, <clears throat> sanding so much on the ebony bridge, and or not on the bridge, uh, on the fingerboard. And it was just so much, so, so, so much work. And, um... And it was just lots of dust. So anyway, I've got, feels like a bit of a runny nose. It's the feeling I have when I hang out in sawmills or in wood shops. But anyway, uh, caveat em tour. Um, buyer beware. So, all right, yeah. Be an amateur, show up with no cash. Um, here it is. Okay, so this is the one that we were just talking about and it drives me freaking crazy. Which is someone says, what's the best you can do? What's your lowest cash price? What's your deal? What's your deal today? Um, all of those, man, they're just not helpful questions. And I try to avoid asking people them. And number one, I mean, the main point I want to make here is that I don't want to get into a position where I get forced to negotiate against myself. That is the worst. I also don't want to put people in a place where I have to, like, are you okay saying out loud, I need you to take less so I could have more? Like, yes, to an extent, but I think the other part of this is that you don't have to, um, how do I formulate this idea? I think by default, most people try to aim for a win-win solution. If I really look at the deals that I have, I often push for a win-lose, or at least I wanna feel a boundary um, in the deal. And so for me, um, I will pitch an idea like, Hey, I'll drive up to you. I'll get the guitar. Um, and I will keep kind of adding things to the deal until I feel someone say, no, like as soon as they, I feel some resistance, I'm like, okay, now I've got the best deal. I got a hundred bucks off. I'm going to get the guitar. I'm going to, we're going to meet at this place. We're going to have somebody check it out. Like, I don't know. I'm just making up those details. That's also like when I buy cars, the same thing. Years ago, there was a sales book I read about negotiation, and it used an example that was like this. It was a guy and his wife were buying a Toyota Corolla, and they're buying it in Dallas. And the guy was like, he needed to, well, yeah, kind of giving away the point of the story, but his wife, they're picking out a car, and he's like, all right, pick something out of the magazine and ask them for it. And so she's like, um, I would like, uh, how about the fog lights package? Oh, absolutely, we can do the fog light. And then it was, he's like, pick something else. And he just keeps telling her to pick things from this new car, whether it's like the undercoating, whether it's the road salt, whatever, whether it's the leather interior. And at some point he just kept pushing and he said, okay, ask for something else. And she said, the only thing left to ask for is the heavy snow package. Uh, and he's like, ask for it. And she finally asks, okay, well, we would like the heavy snow package. And the, and the salesman finally said, hey, we live in Dallas. You're not going to Colorado in this thing. I think that this is the best deal we can give you. And as soon as the guy heard that, that closed the deal. And that's where I feel a lot of times I am too. But it's really unfortunate to force someone to negotiate against themselves. When I'm put in this position, I will say, Patrick, what you say. Like, I, I'll say like, what's the best you can do? Or like, what's the highest you would pay? And so I, I try to diffuse tension or, or steer around tense moments with humor. And so for me, I think kind of show, shedding some light on the fact like, hey, are you okay? Like you're starting with me losing instead of saying, hey, I would love to buy this. And would you trade waiting a couple days to sell it for, you know, me buying it right now? So yeah, this is one that gets me a lot. Uh, <clears throat> 
I got the ebony lung. It's true. Got to wear that PPE. It's true. I always ask about payment preference before meeting. Yeah, I do. I, I clarify and say and say dollar bills on the table. Oh, James. James says the Show Walter series has been amazing to watch. Thanks for that. It's so fun to do. Um, if you're a patron, I finished, there are three more episodes. I, well, there's one that will come out on Monday, but you can watch it now if you're a patron. And this video is brought to you by my patrons. Consider it. Think about it. Three bucks a month. If I can get enough people at three bucks a month, I won't have to do reviews on on office chairs. Um, that video came out this week. No one's really watched it. Well, I mean, 700 and 800 people have watched it. But anyway, um, yeah. <clears throat> but yeah, if you become a patron, you can or channel member, you can just join up above this down below this link. Um, yeah. Your microphone is not working. I can hear your camera mic. Hang on. Settings. Oh, that's really annoying. Does this sound better? I'm sure this sounds way better. So I was just using the computer mic up there. So this should be a lot better. Let me know down below. I just priced the lowest I'm willing to sell. Oh, whoa. I don't enjoy negotiations, so people either buy it or they don't. Boy, you are asking for a painful experience. Um, yes. Yeah, that is a painful, painful experience. That's, I think an amateur move is listing it for the price you need to sell it for because you're just asking to get people just chopping you down at the knees. So I think you need to put it 10 or 15% above. Um, unfortunately, that's kind of, there's a game afoot. Um, yeah, I think that's also, oh man, this was advice from my wife and it was so good. Let me turn this one off and I'll say this one. So imagine that there's like a title over here, but <clears throat> one of the things that my wife said, um, cause an email that came in was that somebody was saying like, Hey, I don't like negotiating. So I price things at what I want to sell them for because I'm socially awkward and I don't know how to read the cues of people when I'm meeting with them. And I end up uh, getting really nervous and I don't feel comfortable and I end up selling guitars for too little. So because of that, I only buy new guitars and I don't ever sell things. And um, I totally get that. And the thing that my wife said that was I thought was so thoughtful and, and really helpful is uh, she said, well, if that's the case, he needs to just work out a script that he can memorize a couple phrases and then he can just be in the moment and he'll know what to say. He'll have these things. And people can either do it or not. And with that, he can, yeah, she said he can move it back to being kind of a mechanical process instead of requiring so much relational energy. Now, the other thing that I think is also helpful is that you can just be set really clear expectations. Like, it is this price. I'm not taking offers. You can say firm. Um, yeah. But I think you're setting yourself up for some pain and suffering. Um, if you, if, if you do that too much. Okay. The sound is great. Yeah. It was just playing through the microphone and the computer because right before I did the, it doesn't matter. I love chairs. I love chairs too. This chair is great. I almost killed myself. Have you guys seen that video where I, oh boy, it goes all the way back and, um, the base, I mean, it doesn't flip over, but it feels like it's going to flip over. And uh, so this chair tried to murder me while I was filming that video. Love your new chair. I do too. It's super, super comfy. And um, if you would like one, there's a link in the description in the other one. It's an affiliate link. So two things happen. One, you get a 20% discount and I get some commission. I forget what it is. I forget the percentage. If you really want to know, I can figure it out, but I forget. But anyway. Chris, Chris is here from Hilton Head, South Carolina. He's probably back at the beginning. So in like 40 minutes, 45 minutes, you'll catch up and you'll hear us talking about you. Chris, I'm glad you're here, buddy. Every time someone emails or texts, what's your lowest price? Once you tell them, they always offer even less. Is there a better way to get around this? I usually diffuse it with humor. Or I ask them to justify their price. 
because <clears throat> that's where I think bringing some light into the negotiating process is really helpful. There are times, and um, it's in here somewhere. Maybe, is it this one, I think? Oh, hang on. Oh, it's this one. Um, when some, okay, so the flip side of what you're talking about, so someone like continually lowballing or continuing to chop you down. The flip side is this, which is um, not playing it cool. When someone shows too much of their hand, when they tell you how much they love this guitar, when they tell you, I've wanted one of these for years. That's it. When someone says that to me, all I hear is just the crisp folding of dollar bills coming out of their pocket. Um, man, it's just, I know I've got them when people say that. The other one is, I've checked online and it's a good deal. That tells me so much. It's just an immediate like, oh, I'm not giving you any possible deal. I think the thing is, probably gone are the days of people not knowing what things are worth at all. I think most people have some idea because especially... Like tools like eBay and Google and Reverb have gotten much better and easier to use and more ubiquitous in in people having access to them. And so most people have a pretty good idea what things are actually selling for. Um, yeah. So I think that, that's a, a big part of it. Um, yeah. So the flip side, um, Ray, you were saying, where'd your comment go? So you're saying every time someone emails or text, what's your lowest price? And then tell them they still offer less. I think for me, I would ask them to justify their price. And then they will reveal to you, it will give you some leverage back in the negotiating. So it's like, all right, so you know that these are selling for about or more than what we are selling it for. So I'm already okay with you making 10 or 15%. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to sell it or whatever. Um, yeah, or yeah, or if you are relentlessly chopping people down and they make you justify, either way, it just brings light into that interaction to where all of a sudden you start kind of realizing, like, okay, he knows I'm get, they know I'm getting a good deal. Um, I need to, I need to relent. So Patrick says, what irks me is when someone on Facebook or Craigslist mentions their matching, their matching price. Mentions their matching prices on Reverb. Reverb has buyer protection fees. Local local sales should be less. That's true. So, yeah. So, when someone says... I think what it's... I'm glad we're talking about this. When people pull comps, it shows so much. It shows that they're, like, thinking about the financials of this. They're not just buying this because they want it. That means they're probably buying this, trying to get to where at some point they could sell it and either break even or make a little bit of money. <clears throat> which isn't wrong by any stretch. Enter drink. Drink number two has entered the chat. I have drink number three over here if I get there. But um, reverb is the most expensive of any place. And part of it is like people are just adjusting to cover fees and they're, you know, thinking about shipping. They're also put, look at shipping prices. Just not what it actually costs. Like, I can ship, I like, I have a ShipStation account, not a sponsor. I would love if they sponsor. I use ShipStation every day. Um, but with ShipStation, I can ship and insure. I shipped and insured a Showalter guitar from here to Iowa with $2,200 in insurance, and it cost me $44. Um, and that's a full-size Dreadnought with a T-shirt, with a case. I mean, it was a 23-pound package, 48 by 18 by 8 and, um, yeah, and I forget the zones, but it still was not that expensive. But you look on Reverb, and it's like 150 bucks for shipping. And I understand people aren't buying, like I'm buying at wholesale pricing. If you'd go to a UPS store, good Lord, it's so much more expensive. I want to sell, I don't know if I can do that. Can I sell my shipping service? Well, hey, what was your question, Sonia? Let me go back through here. This all answers your question. What was your question? Anyway. 
Yeah, Ray says, thanks, Jeremy. I never thought about asking them why they were offering so much less. You think usually stop responding after they lowball. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the normal response. In today's world, there's little excuse for not knowing market value versus condition, et cetera. Yeah, I think that's true. But when when you're so specific, it, like it's just, I mean, deals in some way are all uh, competition. And it's all just like information. And so whoever controls the information controls the deal. And so I'm always looking and I I keep I keep guitar buying and selling as kind of it's a game to me. Like it's fun. I don't take it personally. If I get bested, fine. Okay, whatever. I lost one. Um but but yeah, I think there are there are times where when I can tell somebody is really on the hunt, I'm like, oh. You're trying to figure it out. But also, I've lost most of my anonymity um, around here. If I try and buy any guitar, that's what people ask me why I don't buy more guitars. Because every guitar I try to freaking buy around here, it, as soon as people see my name, uh, they're like, I'm not selling to you. I know who you are. You're trying to make money on me. And then they're and then they watch my videos and then they're gonna rework their listings and take better pictures, put them on more places, and then they all sell for more, which is great. I'm glad that helps. But anyway. Um, yep, 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 yep. Okay, Sonia, what are you, Jeremy, what are your thoughts on eBay sending 1099s because the IRS taxing sales over $600 or more? I think it is, it is a direct assault. Uh, I mean, one, most people that are buying and selling guitars, it is a hobby. And you're allowed to spend money on hobbies. And there's even like, what, cottage law and all this stuff around it. I think it's a direct assault on like the freedom of Americans. Um, because it's not commercial behavior. And it's being taxed like it is commercial work or commercial labor. and um, Or profit from a business. This is not a business endeavor for almost... For most everyone, they just want to buy and sell guitars. And I mean, yeah, I think there's a real, well, yeah, I don't know. You can't sell guns on eBay. Well, you can sell the old, what, pre-1899 or whatever. Like historic firearms. But I think it's it's super unfortunate. I, I mean, it, they just get kind of lumped in. Like I get 1099s from everywhere. and um, But it's I think it's directly bad. Matt, did you hear t-shirts? Um, I need to order more t-shirts. Um, well, it used to, there still was a trigger. I still got 1099s uh, from Reverb a couple years ago. If I'd go above 22,000, I think it was 22,500. Which at that point, like, it's not, a, it's not a hobby. That's a business. Like, you're doing stuff. Um, <clears throat> I don't know. What do you think, Jansen? Like, I, I think, I mean, maybe $600 per transaction. I don't know. I would say, like, do a larger cap. Okay. It was $20,000. Yeah, I think Reverb was twenty two five. I remember in 2018, we filed in 19. I had a, I had a 1099 from, from Reverb. Tell the buyer, only you, me, and Jesus know we're here. That's true. That's a good one. That one involves, you got to be in their house, and they have to have been an idiot in college with MapQuest directions. If you don't know what we're talking about, that happened to me. Um, had a guy, pull, like, just insinuate that uh, I would be in trouble. if. I, and I also, I broke my rule. I tried to renegotiate the deal. I was like, hey, would you do $100 or less? And the guy was like, listen here, buddy. Only you, me, and Jesus know you're here. Anyway, um, there's another one in here. Oh, amateur move. When someone says, I got cash, you want to do it? You want to make a deal? My thought is, of course you do. That's the whole point. I'm not going to take anything other than cash. So it's kind of a useless, like people use this to say, th they use it to say there is urgency, that there is a direct timeline they're trying to close this deal. I'm I'm selling a couple cars for a friend right now and they're parked outside of our house. And 
the amount of people that call me and be like, hey, buddy, what's wrong with that car? Okay, well, hey, buddy, I got cash. I'm I'm out here right now. And I go out there and I talk to him. And then they say, well, I got to run by the bank. I was like, I thought you had cash. She's like, well, I got to go talk to my wife and make sure. I'm like, yeah, man, that's fine. But don't tell me you have cash. Like, it's not helpful because, one, you, you don't. And two, of course you would. Like, that's how this deal is going to get done in cash. Um, one thing I don't do, but I should do, and I, well, I do occasionally, is that I will um, write bills of sale, or sometimes I'll just have like a notepad or I'll print out. I've done it in the past. I'll print out um, like a piece of paper with I blank, am selling blank, for blank, date, serial number. And I was fancy one time and never followed through again. I had a Polaroid and I snapped a picture of the guitar when I bought it. Um, but yeah, I think that that's a really good idea to have some level of uh, kind of some paper trail. Yeah, it was 20 grand on eBay. And uh, if the IRS had to pay there. Yeah. Dwight. Hey, Dwight. How are you, man? Um, I think the whole cash thing comes up in the world of car sales. Like, I want to screw over my finance manager. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, buddy, I'll give you... When people tap the hood or tap the roof. That's kind of one of my favorites. How much? How much? Come on. Uh, my favorite line when people are trying to sell stuff is when you see, like, uh, 1971 D18. It'll blow the doors off any 28 you've ever heard. Uh, and then when people say, uh, I'm asking twenty four ninety five for it and it is on sale or it is for sale. It is not on sale. That, that line gets me. I like that one. Uh, no low ballers. I know what I have. Yeah. I just, I love all that stuff. Let's see. Do you take how long a listing has been posted into consideration before making an offer? When you, uh, I've seen guitars on Craigslist for 30 weeks, offered 85% price, and the owner blew up at me. Uh, yeah. Well, okay. I absolutely look at how long the listing has been around. That's one of my, that's one of the easiest and most helpful pieces of information someone can give me. Oh, your Rickenbacker in the middle of West Virginia has been for sale for $6,000 for 98 days. Okay, well, that's the wrong price for the wrong guitar in the wrong market. And I can prove it because of that number. Now with that, if they have, because the other thing is, think of the person who would leave that post up, who wouldn't come off the price, who wouldn't move it to another market, who wouldn't figure out a way to sell it to the right audience to ship it. That's a person with some cojones. Uh, they are. They have resolve, and they're not going to come off of it, and they're probably super proud about it. And so, man, I just think that um, that with those, more often than not, you're not going to get much movement out of them because they also they have bought into their own BS that it's the greatest guitar that ever played, and if John Lennon was around, he would have bought it from them personally. He would have driven to West Virginia to pick it up. So... I think it's super, super, super helpful when someone says, when someone, when I can see how long something's been up. Someone asked me the other day, hey, should I list these for my my dream price? He had two guitars he was selling, and he was saying, should I list them at my top price and then just leave them up indefinitely? And I said, no, absolutely not, because you're fishing, and you're just giving away information that people will use against you. So you're giving away the information like, oh, this has been up for six months, and it's at a crazy price. And it's coming up on tax season. And I bet that guy is, you know, or is coming up on Christmas. And I bet that guy is hard up for money. So you just, when people have that piece of information, they start speculating about who you are and what would motivate you, or at least a clever person. Because um, it is interesting. Even even buying guitars, you're still in sales. You're selling the person on the on that you are the right person to buy their guitar. And so you still have a lot of power like I can sell them on, I can sell them on selling it to me. And so anyway, uh, yeah. Yeah. No scammers. That'll, that'll show them. Ooh, how much is he asking? You like my accent? I'm not good at accents. I have to kind of think of people in my life, like old country people. 
people. Yeah, I definitely have a bill. I should do it more. Yeah, I don't do it as often. Um, sold a wee cheapo acoustic during COVID for a pal. A left hooker agreed 30 pounds. It's got a ding on it. Yay or nay? He bought it. What? Sorry. I'm not understanding. <laughs> I don't. I don't know what this means. My favorite is when people throw in some weird conspiracy theory, political stuff in their ad. Reminds me of your story you just alluded to. Oh, yeah. 39.5? That's not crazy. That's great. Um, John Chapman last week uh, was telling me that he had an offer at 55 for his 40 D18. I also find it funny when people think mods parts significantly add value to their guitar. People can make more money reverting them back to stock and selling the parts separately. Yep. That'll preach. I agree with that. Yeah, I want to make a video on that. Stuff that doesn't make your guitar more valuable. I just haven't, yeah, anyway. Let's see, John says, if you have an older good fella who wants to sell to someone who will play the guitar, what is your moral decision? That's a big problem I have right now. If you have an older fella who wants to sell to someone who will play the guitar, what is your moral decision? Well, it depends. Is it a guitar that a normal person could afford? I mean, that's the problem. You can, ha yeah, I don't, you don't get to really choose. I mean, you do, but you don't really get to tell people what they have to do with the guitar. I'm selling my 1958 Flying V, but I'll only sell it to someone who will actually play it. And then you're like, well, the only people that can buy that are freaking Joe Bonamassa. And he'll, he'll play it for sure. But, I mean, it's, he's still a collector. And it's going to sit, you know, in, what's his place called? Um, yeah. Say it with a Colin Hay accent. I wish I could. Isn't he Australian? No. He's Scottish. I'm an idiot. It's because he sings the song, Land Down Under. Got it. <laughs> yep. Tim Stanford and that guitar has been on all kinds of albums. Allison Krauss and the like in Bluegrass. It looked really nice. Definitely better. Yeah, John's is rough, rough, rough. Samuel. Sam Chung. And um, Nerdville, yes. So, okay. Let's, ooh, it's after three. Let me run through, how many more are there? I think there's just a couple. Do we talk about this one? Oh, waste people's time. Take too long. Uh, this one's in here. Uh, be indecisive. That's another one in here. But yeah, waste people's time. So a guitar I sold a while ago, just don't take too long. Like you need to make a decision, be decisive. And um, I was trying to sell a favela to a guy a couple years ago and he took 50 minutes of my time. And it was during COVID when we're sitting outside, it's 45 degrees outside. It's like 50 couple degrees outside. He kept talking about how the guitar isn't staying in tune. I'm like, it's an all solid wood guitar and it's cold outside. And, uh, and he also kept moving the capo up and down. He just couldn't commit, couldn't just move past. And I, and I understand I am, I don't know if you guys know this. I'm super extroverted. I've never met a stranger in my life. And, uh, to me, I feel comfortable around people pretty much always, even when I don't feel comfortable. I think it's funny when I feel uncomfortable and then I kind of laugh at it and push through. Um, but yeah, there are people who, and I understand this really can't work through it. And that's where I would go back to my wife's advice earlier, like work out a script, work out what you will say. And then, um, you know, yeah. The other thing is work out what's the actual worst case scenario. You buy a guitar that you don't like, but you know, everything that's wrong with it and you know how much it's worth. Okay. You bought it. All right. Well, if you don't like it in a couple of days, you know, you could, you could sell it. You could get some money back out of it. Um, Here's one, be indecisive. We talked about that. Him and haw, waste people's time. Those two go hand in hand. Don't do your homework. Don't know what things are worth. I've done this before, um, especially when I get into, like I don't buy many Les Pauls because there's just too much to know about them. And I know enough, like I could buy pretty much any Les Paul and have a general idea. But for me, oh, this one came out the other day. Rhett Shaw, uh, Rhett posted on his Instagram story, 
<clears throat> that he was selling his um, the Theodore from Gibson. And I thought it would be a fun guitar for me to have and for you to make a video. And I figured he doesn't sell much stuff used. I'll just buy it for whatever he's asking. And then I'm sure I'll be able to break even or make some money on it. Um, and I'll make a video that will make some money. And I made it. I texted him. I was like, how much for the Theodore? And he texted me back. And he said, I'm asking $47.50. It's like, good Lord. <clears throat> I had no idea that those guitars are worth that. They... <clears throat> They look like a pineapple. They're ugly. They're not cool. They have no real history. They're like, oh, you know what we would have made? That's Gibson's marketing on that guitar. You know what we should have done? We should have made a guitar that would have competed with the Telecaster. But they didn't. But she didn't. And, um, yeah. So, maybe, they're yeah, they're all custom shop. But, anyway, they're a bit nonsense to me. But, anyway, it, it was a little, it took me, there was a little misstep. I had to text Red, and I was like, I'm sorry. I did not do my homework at all. I had no clue that that's what they sold new for. Had no clue that that's what they're selling for used. So, they sold new for five. And I think the used ones, there's only one or two used ones out there. And they're, you know, they're $4,250, 4500 something like that. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Need more likes, folks. Yes, please do. Please like, subscribe, consider becoming a patron or a channel member. Channel members get early access to all kinds of videos. I'm also going to do some exclusive merch for patrons. I know I've talked about it, and uh, part of it is that I just, I'm back to having everything on my plate, editing videos and all the admin. Um, part of that is Dylan graduated from college, and he's off doing stuff. And then Skylar passed away, and I just haven't gotten a new assistant. I have an interview with an assistant supposed to do that this week if i would have had an assistant she would have they would have been able to schedule a meeting with my new assistant anyway dumb um i have too much going on that's the that's the real main thing i'm also trying to build a guitar in here um yeah patrick says i can't get on board with the theodore they didn't make them in the back for a reason it'd be ugly <laughs> That's funny. Yes, dude, I totally agree. I just think there's like, you know what we should have done? We should have made a bad guitar. Uh, yeah, it's just, it's not a cool design. It's not a pretty thing. So anyway, but they're freaking expensive. Another, another Gibson misstep this week, the Ukraine guitar. Always doing what no one asked for or wanted. Ooh, I haven't seen that. I'll have to look it up. Guitar Huntrun, Huntrion merch. Yeah, Huntrion. I like that. Um, let me see if I have any others. I think I have one more. Um, oh, uh, amateur move number 13, uh, ask for a return window. Um, this is to, to ask for the deal to not play by the normal rules of the deal, which is you get what you get and you don't throw a fit. I mean, that's advice for a two year old and it still has to be advice for 28 year olds that bought a guitar on a credit card. And all of a sudden they realize they shouldn't have bought that and the credit card bills do. And now they say, well, I, the, the, this guitar has, um, the action is pretty high and it must have gone up. And I think you must have abused this guitar. And so I need you to take it back. Can you, can you return it? Um, and then, yeah. And then you remind people. Sorry, the deal's a deal. When you played it, you said you liked it. You left happy. I made sure you were happy when you left. Um, I'm not a guitar shop. I'm just a person. And so I'm sorry that deal's done. And, you know, I'm sure you'd you'd be okay selling it. And then people will get angry. And you're like, then you have to remind people, hey, you're an adult. You entered into a deal. And, you know, this is a private party. Sure, you could have bought the same guitar from a guitar shop, but it would have cost 30% more or 20% more. So you just have to people walk, you have to walk people through all of the ways in which all the decisions that they didn't realize they were deciding on, they got them to a place that they gave you money and you gave them a guitar and then you both left. Um, I had a guitar and every now and then I will give people a deal, especially if I'm selling a guitar like from me here in Virginia and it goes to Iowa or it goes to wherever, <clears throat> when I give somebody a guitar <clears throat> that they've never played before they paid for it, I'll say, hey, you got 48 hours. Check it out. Make sure you like it. If not, we'll split shipping coming back. And so that way I split shipping. And so, and I just call it like 40 bucks um, to come back, 50 bucks. And uh, cause that's basically what it'll cost me, but it gives them a little barb in it. Like, okay, like 
I'm renting this guitar for two days. If I don't like it, I rented it for two days for 40 bucks. Okay, that's 20 bucks a day. However, they need to justify it. But I think an amateur, an amateur thing is to ask for it. And a professional thing to do is to offer it. Don't offer it on most deals, but offer it like if you're selling something somewhat far away. All right, that was my last one. Um, <laughs> I like this. Yikes, I don't have the stones to ask for a return window. Yes, that's because you are a reasonable, sensible adult that has a healthy understanding of self and relational currency. Like all of that. Because it's the people that are the people that just expect every system in the world to bend to accommodate their impulsivity. You can tell I'm a little fired up about this. This one gets me. Um, yeah. Have you thought about transitioning into the boutique building side of the guitar business? I have. Uh, after building this one with Show Walter, I'm like, ooh, I like this, and it's not as scary as I always thought it was. Like I've, I've been around guitar building for a long time, but I've always thought I'm just not precise enough, but I've realized that, I mean, guitars are very precise, but you know, as long as you go slow and you don't, you know, cut before you think, cut before you measure, cut before you measure two or three times. Um, yeah. Even yesterday we did the fretboard and I'm like, Oh boy, I'm like a 32nd of an inch off on one of the frets. It is what it is. Anyway, I don't, I didn't, yeah, it's down kind of low. Shouldn't be the end of the world, but it definitely is a thing that we have to, we have to think about. Hey, OCE Puddles is here. Chris, hey buddy. The, I only use amateur moves because I want to stay eligible for the Olympics. That's good. <laughs> that's a, that's a good line. Um, yeah, so, um, Chris makes amazing pedals. You have a pedal launching Monday, Tuesday? What is it? I just saw it on your Instagram story. Um, yeah. If you don't follow OCE pedals, Chris is a guy worth cheering for uh, and worth supporting. So he's awesome, makes amazing stuff. I've got a wrapped pedal that he made. The monkey wrench. Where is it? It's in here. There it is. Look how freaking cool this thing is. Huh? It is just the freaking cat's pajamas. And uh, yeah, so the pliers are coming out on Tuesday. and um, But this one is just... I don't like fuzz pedals, and I love this. It's like a distortion that gets really fuzzy. It does this kind of gated, squishy thing um, that is so fun. And uh, so anyway, great pedal. Chris, I'm excited you're here, man. Thanks for watching. Um, I think that's it. We did an hour and 15 minutes, hour and 13 minutes, 30 seconds right now. And, uh, yeah, it's been a super fun live show. And, um, yeah, hopefully this helps you not be an amateur. Hopefully this also helps you just like in your community. Cause all of us, I mean, it's crazy. What countries we talked about India, Scotland, Ireland, Hong Kong. Um, we talked about the U S we talked about Canada. We've been talking about California, Missouri, Virginia, all over the world, West Virginia, um, St. Louis, Seattle, all kinds. I mean, across the world. And so all of us, you know, spread, but still united. Like we're going to help people in our community figure out how to not be a-holes, um, how to, you know, be cool and to not, uh, be concavium. That's a, there's a phrase in Christianity called, uh, concavium, which is the idea that you turn in on yourself and you become ingrown. Kind of gross, like a toenail. We help people grow out. That's what the world needs. Grow out into bigger, better people um, that help other people grow out and cause good to push out into the world. So, anyway, um, best live show yet. That's that's high praise. Um, I love when we have good ones. They're not, they're not all great, you know. I do my best. Sometimes I do less than best. I still sometimes use the phrase good is better than perfect, but I want to, I want to do some things perfect. I want to do some things excellent. Um, so anyway, <clears throat> um, but Evan said something. Evan says, I was just in, C in St. Louis last week. Didn't get to make it to any of the shops, but it's a rad town. That's awesome. Sort it pal on with it. 
<laughs> We're speaking the same language and I still don't understand some things. Anyway, um, thanks for watching this video. Um, please, one of the easiest ways for you to support the channel is to just hit a thumbs up on this video. Make sure you're subscribed. I know every single YouTuber you pay attention to says that, but it's crazy. 64% um, of people watching my videos still aren't subscribed. That's crazy. So please do me a favor. It's free, but it affects my livelihood and business and my ability to keep making these videos. Other ones, I'm still looking for partners. If you want to partner with me by being a patron or a channel member, that stuff really helps to where I don't have to take... I've turned down a lot of video game sponsorships because I just, it feels so unnatural to me and my brand. I don't play video games, I play guitars. And so I'd rather keep my interest and focus on guitars. I'd rather keep my free time going towards guitars and creativity and making music, putting it out into the world. So anyway, um, yeah. So, hey, Bulldog, just found your channel a couple weeks ago. Really enjoying it. Keep up the good work. Thank you. Yeah, this is fun. I'm Lots of people... That video about the Gibson L3 has blown up. It is two times bigger, uh, 100%. It's 530,000 views right now. I have no channel. I have no video on my channel that's received that many views. And that video just continues to just take off. So anyway, um, but yeah, become partners, patrons, channel members. Check out stuff that's for sale. I have two Eastmans that'll be for sale this weekend. Anyway, that's the end of the video. Thanks for watching. You guys are wonderful. This really, I love this community of people that have come up around Guitar Hunters and hope that all of you, like I said earlier, hope you all go out and fill the world with music and friendship. Help people become the best version of themselves as you inter interact with them buying and selling guitars. All right. Bye, everybody. Have a great weekend.